What's more fun than listening to us in your car or at work every Wednesday or Friday? Seeing us perform an episode of Sinisterhood for you live. We are currently on tour, and the first and second leg of shows was a blast. We just had amazing shows in Boston and New York City, and we'll be playing Philadelphia tonight, June 17th. We can't wait. Then, in a couple weeks, we're going to head to Chicago and Milwaukee. And we're rounding out the tour in sunny Florida with shows in Tampa and Orlando. At every single stop, we choose a local topic and perform an episode of Sinisterhood for you live. It's like you're right there in the studio with us. We even throw in a fun bonus segment at the end where we get to hear from you in the audience. It's probably the most fun part of the show. <laughs> it gets wild and rowdy. Uh, it's Shouting. a lot of fun. And we've been getting updates already from <laughs> people. So it's all happening in real time comes at you fast. Tickets for shows are available now. Visit Sinisterhood.com slash live shows for the details including dates, times, venues, and more. That's Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. See you on the road. A bump in the night Your heart fills with dread Probably a murderer who wants you dead It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse It's hopeless, you're doomed, you'd call a priest if you could You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood I'm gonna kill you Welcome to another edition of Freaky Friday Ooh. We tell your odd but true stories And Christy? You have curated quite a selection today. Thank you so much. Um, I'll tell you what, one of these kept me up for hours last night. It's a mystery. Uh, it's at the very end, mm -hmm. and I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of emails, DMs, comments with people's theories, So, which it's the, the poster is asking for. So yes. we need your help in solving this mystery. But it legitimately kept me up last night. As <laughs> Robert Stack, you could be the one to solve you this could. unsolved mystery. Mm -hmm. We just need our trench coats. Uh, we do need trench coats. You know what? I have a trench coat. It used to be my I dad's. A trench coat. I have a trench coat that used to be my mom's. Whoa. <laughs> We should wear our trench coats. <laughs> photo shoot in a trench coat. It's a very, I feel like it's very stylish trench coat. My brother, when we were going through my dad's stuff, he was like, that's a good looking coat. You should keep that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I need to get it like dry clean and stuff. But yeah. Let's do it. Some fun hats will look like McGruff the Crime Dog oh. or Robert Stack. Either one. We, yes, or both. Yes, we, we should definitely do that. Well, we're going to start off with one that's a little lighter. This is from Jess, and this is called Zach Bagan's Nightmares. Hello, just a quick thank you for your podcast. It gets me through every workday, so thank you. I have always been a believer of the paranormal, but like you two, I've had my doubts with the legitimacy of Zach Bagan's ghost encounters on his show Ghost Adventures. A few months ago, my husband, who is obsessed with Zach Bagan's and Ghost Adventures, and I were in Las Vegas for a concert. Zach has his haunted museum there. And because my husband has always wanted to go, and I love everything paranormal, we decided to check it out. I will say, I was very surprised with the heavy feeling I felt while in the museum. I became very irritated with my husband standing so close to me and formed an unexplainable hatred for one of the women in our group. This irritable feeling stayed with me the entire tour of the museum. Once we were out of the museum, I felt absolutely fine, other than feeling very drained from the experience. That night, I had a dream that one of those old doctor's masks, the ones that look like bird beaks, was sitting on our shower head with big eyes that would stare at me. I obviously felt terrified, but didn't connect the museum to this nightmare. Fast forward a few months later, my husband and I went on a cruise. The first night we were on the cruise, a woman who was staying on the same deck we were died in her sleep. That next day, my husband asked if I had felt anything paranormal since the museum, to which I responded, no. But that night as I was trying to fall asleep, I felt a hand pressing on my back as if to push me. I was confused because I was facing my husband, who was on the other side of the bed, and we were the only ones in our small cruise room. I had nightmares every night on the cruise after that experience. I strongly feel that my visit to the haunted museum opened something up for ghosts to make stronger contact with me. Zach Bagans is definitely overdramatic in his TV show, 
but he's on to something when it comes to his haunted objects and the entities attached to them. Well, he says in that, don't touch anything, because that's when Post Malone touched Mm -hmm. the Dybbuk box in that museum. And there are just a lot of heavy energy objects there. It's kind of, there's some death chairs and and things people wore when they died or mm-hmm. chairs they sat in when they died and things like that. So I think there's definitely some negative energy mm-hmm. there. I've I've been in a tour group and have hated someone unexplainably. I was so going to say, I relate. my husband standing too close to me and me raging out, <laughs> everyday occurrence. <laughs> Having uh, just hatred out of nowhere for someone in a group all the time. So those things... For me, a, a, a museum, a uh, haunted museum or not, that's probably going to happen. <laughs> Maybe but, if you go to Zach Bagan's museum, you won't have those feelings oh, anymore. It's the reverse. It I like that. Well, I should definitely check it out. The um, the thing happened on the cruise ship is eerie for sure. I wonder if she's implying that whatever followed her had to do with this woman's death. Or just she's more sensitive now and that... Because normally, maybe if the woman who died was trying to make contact with someone, then she wouldn't feel it because the Jess was just like sleeping. But because Jess went to this museum, it's like, well, now I'm it's like once the door is open, then Mm. all of a sudden you're starting to see things that you didn't want to see. So maybe the the hand on her back was the woman. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. Maybe she was in the wrong room because it was the person on the same deck. She was going room to room trying to find where she was. That's also a can put a damper on the cruise if a passenger dies while you're on the cruise. It happens all the time. That's what I hear. It's they have a frequent. they have a like I don't know if it's a morgue, but they have an area down below like that's storage. like where it, I mean I guess it is a morgue because it's specifically like they put like a chilled thing they put them in to keep them. It's there. not the deep freezer for the kitchen. It's a separate no. Thing. It's like a separate room because it's not uncommon that it happens. Yeah. yeah. Emergencies happen on the high seas. Mm-hmm. So yes, that's that is true. <laughs> I would like to go to the to the museum though. If I next time I'm in Vegas, which I've only been once, so if I ever go again, I will check it out. We will go again because Las Vegas is a great place and I love it. <laughs> and I'd like to say that that's on right. record. <laughs> Well, this next one is from Brett Van Blurcom, and it is called My First Time Calling 911. Hi, Heather and Christy. Sending a submission all the way from Nova Scotia, Canada. You guys rock. A couple of months ago, I had a brush with, well, I'm not exactly sure what. It was a regular work night. Cannot remember the day of the week. I was literally crawling into bed when I heard this crazy noise of tires screeching right outside my window which is right next to my bed. I looked out and a car had gone off of the road and smashed into a tree right below my window. It was a warmer night in January, so it could not have been from icy roads. The next thing I know, there is a woman jumping out of her car, screaming at the top of her lungs, call 911, call 911. The same woman then gets back into the car and starts hitting and slapping the person who was behind the wheel. She then gets out and starts running around on my street, continuing to scream. Not knowing if anyone else was seeing this, I decided to call 911 to report the incident. My hands were shaky. I had never had to call 911 before. I explained what I saw, and they sent police and a fire truck to the scene. The 911 operator told me I could potentially receive a call from police as a witness in the next couple of days. After my call ended with 911, I continued monitoring what was going on outside. This lady was still distraught, and since I was close enough, I opened my window to see if I could hear what was being said. To me, it sounded like she said this man had jumped into her car and was trying to kidnap her. The man had since fled the scene. It was so insane. The police were there for about an hour or so after I had called, with the woman still distraught. I never did hear from the police, and I do not have any idea what really happened, but it was so crazy. Wow. She may have thwarted a kidnapper just by wrecking her car. I have often thought if someone were to jump in my car or I was had been like forced into a car and they were taking me somewhere, if I was behind the wheel, I would intentionally crash into something mm-hmm. to get out of it. it ideally in front of people. 
yeah, a house or like you said, hit a car, but not hard enough to hurt the other mm-hmm. person or hit a building that's, you know, a restaurant or something where you can not damage and hurt people inside, but it's at least enough people to come out and be witnesses. I would, yeah. Or like a, a stop sign or a, a yeah light, a traffic light pole or something like that. Yeah. Something where it's like an intersection mm-hmm. that other people are going to see. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah, that's uh it's also I've ca- I've had to call 911 many times and it never isn't scary. It's oh, always yeah. like a, a a shaky hand type thing. Uh so I would like to say it gets better if you have to call, but it doesn't cuz you're it's nobody ever wants to call 911. It's never a good situation if you're calling 911. No, and God bless the operators who can, like, take a person mm-hmm. who has shaky hands and is like, I don't know what I saw, and parse out the information mm-hmm. and say, okay, we need to get what we need to get from you. Stay on the phone with me. It'll be okay. Like she said, the police may come and talk to you. It must be that they had whatever they needed from the just the scene or whatever that they didn't need um, Brett's uh, input. Yeah. Because it may just have been like, you know, you saw the car crash or you heard it crash. It's not, I think the argument's not like whether the car crashed in the tree. It's like what happened leading mm-hmm. up to that. So that's probably why the, you know, the police didn't need a witness or anything like that. But that is horrifying that she was having to not only get into a car accident, but then fight off the person mm-hmm. that had been driving. So definitely good on you for calling. And that he especially... got away. So now he's just out there on in the loose. Yeah. Right. But this is the lesson. Don't be afraid to make a ruckus and scream yeah. and yell if you mm-hmm. feel like your life is in danger because get the attention of somebody. Yeah, and Brett was being a very good neighbor, mm-hmm. not just going, some crazy person was yelling at my window, but like, okay, you said call, I will call. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, this next one is from Jen, and the subject line is tracksuit ghost. About 25 years ago, I worked a four-hour paper route covering suburban and rural customers that ended with homes a half mile apart, shrouded in country dark with ditches on either side of the road, and where nobody was out in the wee morning hours. Ever. The gig was a transition job. I'd blown out both my wrists after an SUV hit me while I was bicycling. The accident, which ended my animation career, left me unable to use my hands effectively for a year. Wrapping my brain around those life changes was a bit of a roller coaster, and in that respect, Having a job I could physically perform that involved a few hours of quiet solitude to think about life was probably a good thing, but at some point it was time to move on. The mechanics of the rural deliveries was always the same. Drive carefully on the left side of the road, grab a paper off the passenger seat, slow down long enough to shove it in the paper box, speed up, and move on. The third to last morning of my route, I was delivering to one of the dark rural sections and had pulled up to a delivery box arm out the window when I noticed a disheveled man in his 20s wearing a very distinct tracksuit a couple decades out of style. He was staggering along the top of the ditch right by the paper box. It scared the shit out of me, not just to see anyone out there, but because I hadn't seen the man as I pulled up to the box and he was literally inches from my exposed arm. He didn't look at me. He only stared blankly ahead and staggered along. I shoved the paper in the box and sped off, heart racing over the encounter, but thinking nothing more of it. The next morning, I was driving the route with my replacement, showing her the ropes. The timing of the route was fairly consistent. I usually reached the same points at roughly the same times every morning. That timing held true as we pulled up to the house where I'd seen the man in the tracksuit the previous morning. A same ballpark time, but nobody was around. The only oddity was my car started sputtering. It shook a few times, then all the electrical went out, although inertia kept moving us forward. Kind of like running out of gas where you don't stop all at once, but have a few seconds of gentle drifting and profanities to accept the situation. My first thought was how annoying it was going to be getting stranded there. This was before the everyone always has a cell phone era had taken hold. For all you younger listeners, yes, there was a time you could be truly screwed if your car died on a country road at 3 a.m., I didn't fancy the idea of sitting in the middle of the road until daybreak, nor was I going to risk knocking on a stranger's door in the dead of the night. But as we drifted beyond the paper box where I'd seen the man in the tracksuit, the electrical in my car fired back up, and we were on our way, as if nothing happened. Again, I didn't think anything more of it, just counted my good fortune and finished the route. The final morning, I was back at the same paper box at the exact same time as the previous two mornings. As I pulled up to the box... The tracked suit motherfucker appeared in the same damn spot. 
He was staring blankly ahead, staggering along the same way he had been before. I hit the gas, screaming, fuck, 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 the whole way down the road, blowing gravel all to hell and missing every delivery on the rest of that road. I don't know what to make of those three mornings, but seeing the same dude at the same time doing the same thing, plus all the electrical weirdness when he wasn't there, has always left me leaning toward a ghostly encounter that, for whatever reason, decided to manifest as I was tapping out. I never went back to that spot again. While I never researched any deaths along that road, I've always wondered about it. Anyway, absolutely love the show, especially your humor. To that point, a while back I emailed you an answer to your question about how scuba divers relieve themselves. It occurred to me after I sent it what a dive instructor takes for granted as amusing diving ain't a glamour sport anecdotes might freak some folks out. My sincerest apologies if it did, and if I put you further off diving after that. Oh, it wasn't the email that put me off <laughs> diving. <laughs> I remember that email quite well. We emailed back and forth. But yeah, that's not why I don't dive. No, no, it's no. It's the it's, sharks for me. Yeah, it's it's the giant whale that's the size of a dinosaur. It's, <laughs> it's bigger the, than a dinosaur. Um, just uh, crushing weight of water on top of me um, in the, in just pure darkness. That's why I don't do it. So <laughs> it's the abyss. Yeah, <laughs> it does it for me. Um, this is a very spooky because of like they like she said like researching if there was a death along the road or something. I mean, you hear about phantom hitchhikers, but being in a tracksuit in the same spot near a dark area with a ditch that could be some sort of a residual spirit that died very suddenly my you know, thought was it was perhaps an unhoused person or someone just that was um struggling mentally that was living around the area because we see a lot of unhoused people the same people in our area all the time like that's mm -hmm. they post up at the same spot so maybe he had a routine of walking i don't know maybe it was in an area where it would have been really really bizarre for someone to be out there like that or a neighbor jogging, and they're, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, they just look rough because they're jogging. <laughs> I mean, early. I would if I was jogging at any time, but especially 3 a.m. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah, but, uh, yeah, the, the car dying is definitely weird as well. All right, well, this next one we have is from Grace, and the subject line is Nighttime Visitors. Hi, ladies. I'm obsessed with the Freaky Friday stories. Keep them coming. I have several stories I want to share, but this one is definitely my favorite. So, some background. I grew up in a small town, and my family's home is located in the middle of a 100-acre farm, bordered on two sides by a river, and located at the end of a dead-end road with no neighbors other than my grandparents at the time of the story. My house was built on a hill, so the front is one story, but the back is two stories. My childhood bedroom was in the two-story part and on the corner of the house with a window on two walls. This story takes place when I was four years old, and no one ever told it to me until I was in my early 20s. I've asked many times since then to hear it again, and it never changes. Okay, so, occasionally, over the course of a few months, I had been waking up in the night and reporting that I was seeing monsters in my bedroom. Specifically, I was seeing the Joker guy in the mirror over my dresser. I guess from Batman, I'm not sure, what I as an adult remember is a creepy, pale face. It didn't happen often, and my parents assured me it was just my imagination and would tuck me back in. But then, something happened that changed their minds. This happened in the winter of 1990. My parents were Southern Baptist types and had hosted a Sunday school party on the night in question, meaning there was no alcohol involved. They had put me to bed as usual and then finished up their shindig and sent their friends home. After going to bed themselves, my mom woke up to find my dad standing stark-ass naked, her words, staring out the window. The window in their room faced the same direction as one of mine. She asked him what it was, and he said he didn't know. She got up to look, and according to them both, it was an unidentifiable, bright light in the sky. When telling the story, my parents always described the way they felt, inexplicable desire and longing to get close to the light. They went outside and started walking across the field toward the light, but say they never seemed to get any closer. They say it was just there, hovering in the sky, super bright, but nothing else distinguishable about it. Again, this is the winter, and they were both naked and barefoot, but that did not stop them. They just kept trying to get close to it, until, all of a sudden, 
It just vanished. Poof. Gone. This is the part of the story where they talk about the way they felt again. This time, they were completely devastated that it was gone. My mom likes to say she sort of fell in love with it, which I find to be a very strange detail. Also, for the record, my dad, now deceased, confirmed every word of this story, despite 0% believing in aliens, paranormal, or even religion at the time. So then, with the light gone, they just go back to bed. Over the next few weeks, they find out other people in our small town had also seen it. Someone in their church group saw it, according to his wife, my mom's bestie, but he didn't believe in that shit. And for the past 30 plus years has refused to speak of it. Another guy that worked with my mom had been drinking and was on his way home from the bar coming down the interstate when he saw it and made his wife pull over, jumped out of the car and started running towards it. He said he felt the same urge to get closer to it. So back to little kid me and my I'm seeing a joker in the mirror nightmares. The day after the incident, I reported the same experience, only this time it wouldn't go away. So I got up, put my blanket over the mirror so I couldn't see it anymore, and went back to sleep. It hadn't happened in a while, but the fact that it happened on the same night as their experience completely freaked them out, though they didn't want their little kid to know that. So much so that despite having a five-bedroom house, they started having me sleep in the other bedroom with my older sister. I never moved back into that bedroom, even though it's the biggest one. It always just creeped me out when I got older. All through high school and college, I avoided it. Now that I know the whole story, I'm definitely not sleeping in there. Sorry this is so long, but it's just such a crazy story. I try to get everything in there. Thanks again for being awesome. Mom and Dad be sleeping naked. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> He's running butt naked and barefooted through a Both field of grace. You're, they were, that night, they couldn't get enough of that light. That light, I mean, had, that light was calling to him. Got in the dead of winter? Him. Yeah. That's cold. It's, uh, it. yeah, it's, this is very alien-ish, especially if multi- multiple people see it and you hear from people that claim to see that light, that it is very inviting and you, you can't really explain explain it you know what's Travis weird Walton i was it. just earlier thinking about um uh close encounters of the third kind and how like this they can't explain it why they have these uh, these visions and they want to get to this thing and man drawn in i want to see even one. no pants just free balling it running towards the light if i could see a ufo i'd run across the field naked yeah, I mean, if especially it sounds like it wasn't even a conscious choice. It was an urge of like, I love you, light. I have to be mm-hmm. near you, light. So, but I'm sure. saying, if any aliens are listening, I'll promise you right now, if you show yourself to me, I'll streak through the neighborhood. You'll show yourself. Yes, to them. I will. <laughs> tip for tip. Yes. Oh yeah, we we were Tommy was watching Arrival the other day. And I was just watching part of it. That's such a good movie, first of all. But I was like, God damn, I want to communicate with an alien. Oh, yeah. So they, bad. You'd be the a one. Nice you'd be one. The I, one. Not a nice one. Not like a mean one. Not no, a Cloverfield alien. No, not an alien alien. No, with, or um, that alien. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, alien. Those are bad ones. Well, thank you, Grace. Um, the next one is from Leanne. Not my Leanne, because there's one E missing. But mm-hmm. Leanne, and the subject line is, Ouija found my uncle. In 1993, I was 14 when my favorite uncle suddenly went missing. He left for work one morning and was just gone for three months. My close southern Midwest family was rocked. My dad, his brother, wasn't sleeping. My aunts, his sister, were posting flyers and talking to reporters. The police were following every lead they got. It was pretty unheard of that someone in our area would just disappear. One night, my cousins and I were having a sleepover, and I suggested we get the Ouija board out. After asking all the typical 14-year-old girl questions, who will I marry? Does Johnny like me too? Et cetera, et cetera. I bravely asked, where is Uncle Bobby? The oracle just kept spelling underwater over and over again. We were nowhere near water, so we all kind of marked it up to, well, this is odd, and went to bed. A few weeks later, my uncle was found in a creek. He had driven off the road on his way to work that morning, hit a guardrail, and was killed instantly, but was thrown from the car into the creek, and the car landed upside down on top of him. The creek was high, and it was early when the accident happened, so there was no witness or evidence. He was only found because the water had receded, as it does seasonally, and someone saw the tires of his upside-down car. There he was, 
underwater, just as Ouija told us. I don't think any of us ever mentioned it to our parents. I think I would have mentioned it to my parents, although, I don't know, maybe not. Nah, I probably would have. Yeah, maybe. I mean, if you're, you know, 14, it depends on, you know, if they're in the mood, not in the mood to hear it, but it sounds like they were really struggling with the disappearance. Yeah. And it's like, well, it might make them more sad. What does it help, it really? Help. They yeah. also might be like, why are you playing with that thing? Also that. But also, why are you playing with that thing? That is, uh, that is inter- that's interesting. Yeah, that's definitely... Um, as a kid, I think that's kind of like your way to deal with it too. Maybe like emotionally grapple with it of like, well, this thing can provide answers. Let's ask it what we're all really wondering. Mm. It's a really hard thing. Well, thank you, Leanne. And our last one we have is from Sammy. And the subject line is the stranger who had a key to my apartment. I moved into my apartment in 2012. It's a studio one block from the beach in Southern California and my apartment is one of eight units in our building that has had multiple property management and ownership changes over the years. I live alone, and I've never given a copy to my key to anyone. Some relevant background on me before continuing. I'm a flight attendant, and although I live in the Los Angeles area, for a few months I was based in San Francisco for work. That means I commuted to work via airplane from LAX to SFO for all my trips. You might assume that flight crew are rarely home, and that is true, even if they're based at their home airport. But crew members who have to commute to another airport are home even less because they're using their days off to fly to and from work. So back in 2018, I'd been living in my L.A. area apartment for six years at that point, and I was commuting to SFO on a regular basis, so I was barely ever home. I would often be gone for five plus days back home for one or two days, and then gone for another four or five days again. One Sunday afternoon that June, I was enjoying a rare day off at home. It was the middle of a beautiful sunny day, and I was sitting on my bed facing my front door, which was closed and locked. Suddenly, I heard a slight noise out front, but initially didn't think anything of it, as I always attributed any small clatter to my next-door neighbor because our apartments are so close together. That is, until I noticed my doorknob turning. I jumped out of my bed and went straight for my front door. As I opened the door, I found a man placing a key into the lock of my doorknob. I yelled, can I help you with something? The man looked stunned, confused, bewildered, and bamboozled. Not threatening at all, he replied, uh, the police gave me this key when I got out of the hospital while giving me the key he had in his hand. Well, I live here, I said again. Uh, sorry, he said as he turned around and walked away. When he was gone, I took the key to test it if it worked on my door. And sure enough, it was a completely working key to my apartment. It was a single key on a key ring that had a tag on it with my property management's logo displayed, as well as both my address and October 2010 handwritten on it. It looked like the type of key you're given by a landlord to view a vacant apartment. As a reminder, this incident occurred in 2018, and I had moved into the apartment in 2012, two years after the date on the tag. This begs the question, has this working key to my apartment with my actual address handwritten on the key ring just been floating out there in the universe for eight years, six of which I've been living here? I might as well have had the GPS directions for any stranger to have while we're at it. It took me about 10 minutes of trying to process what had happened when I realized it'd probably be a good idea to call the police. They tried to look for the guy, but unfortunately, I wasn't much help in giving a description because I hadn't paid much attention to where he went when he left. Did he leave on foot? Was a car waiting for him? No clue. He honestly looked just as surprised to see me open the door as I was to see him standing there. Because it was a Sunday, the property management office was closed, but I went into their office the first thing Monday morning. I handed them the key and described what happened. They told me that while it's absolutely their policy to change the locks every time a tenant moves out, they had only taken ownership of my apartment building in 2016 and couldn't speak to what happened in 2012 when I moved in or in 2010, the date of the tag. They pulled files that should have had records of all previous tenants, but only found records for someone who lived there from 2007 to 2009 and 2011 to 2012 and then for myself, who moved in 2012. There was a gap for any record of who lived there in 2010. There really isn't any proper conclusion to this story, other than they sent someone out to change my locks immediately. 
The identity of the man will always be a mystery. Now on to the what ifs and the loose theories. One, I cannot stress how rare it is for me to be home back then. What if this had happened when I wasn't home? Would he have robbed me and I'd return home to an empty apartment? Or would he have moved himself in and used my shower, ate my food, and came and went for days until I got home? Two, what if he had been in my apartment before, and that's why he was so confused when I answered the door, because he wasn't used to anyone being there? Three, what if he did this in the middle of the night while I was sleeping instead of midday? Would he have hurt me? What if that did happen already and I just didn't know because he had left without saying anything? Four, was he really coming from the hospital like he claimed? This is far-fetched, but was he in a coma or in prison and this was the last place he lived and the only place he knew to come back to? Maybe the key was part of his personal belongings that were returned to him. The fact that the key was so impersonal and didn't have anything else on it, like unique keychains or other keys, made me think that this is unlikely. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Let me know if you have any theories. Like I said, this kept me up last night. <laughs> I'm still thinking about it. Do you have a theory? Well, until... And she made a really good point. Sammy made a really good point at the end that if it had been he was in a coma and like they gave me this when I got out of the hospital, it would have maybe had some sort of a more personal key situation. I wonder if the person had worked at the property management office or something and that's what or something like that and they had that key still and maybe they shacked up there while before it got sold or before she moved in. I don't know. So no, the answer is no, I don't have a theory. I had one, but Sammy debunked it with the no personal keychain theory. What was the theory? I was like, well, maybe he was in a coma. Well, I think that that theory could still still be true because maybe it wasn't his personal keychains, but the the apartment gave a key to police or uh, the hospital. May if something occurred at the apartment, police were called. And they didn't know where his keys were, something maybe management gave police a key. But with that, why? I mean, that w- it was 2010 to 20, that was eight years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, um, I, if, if eight years later I woke up out of a coma, I don't think I would think, well, my apartment that I lived in eight years ago is probably uh, still waiting there for me. You know what I mean? I would. Yeah, especially like an apartment. You would assume that, well, I haven't been paying rent because I haven't been in a coma. So they probably move my stuff out. You would, or you would knock on the door. Yeah. I think she is correct that he had been there before. Ooh, like I, he happened to have a key. And since she was never home, he was just. And maybe not just in. him. I think I think if it was known that she wasn't there a lot, that, you know, if you are needing a place to stay and you know someone isn't going to be there, and maybe that gets around, like, a friend group or something, and you just kind of come and go and, and hope they're not there, or they they know her schedule or something. I mean, or you just bank on the fact that, like, first of all, I don't know how flight attendants and crew do it because I could not travel that much, and that's... Yeah, I my hat's off to you to be home for like one day. But yeah. if you for eight years have been at that apartment like one day a week, then the odds of you getting to stay there if you don't live there and no one's bothering you are pretty good. That's true. Do you think that he was had some connection to the management office prior or current when she lived there? I don't know. It's so weird that they didn't have any record for that one year. That is strange. I don't, I can't explain that. Yeah. I need to think about it more. I don't know if, I mean, unless it, yeah, there was some weird thing with management and they purposely like destroyed that file or something. I don't. Yeah, or an employee or something lived there. And then when they left, they're like, I don't want anyone to know I lived here. And they take it with them. I don't know. It's very strange. It's also very creepy to think this key has been floating around with your address on it for eight years. But I do think that my gut says it wasn't the first time. Certainly. And maybe if the person, if it was a 
stealth situation, not a brazen, well, I have a right to be here. This is just a, and mm-hmm. you, I think you would know it wasn't a model apartment when you, you can tell the difference, you know, mm-hmm. when you have those like cheesy flower pictures on the wall versus like pictures of actual people. Mm-hmm. So if it was a self situation, to your point, they would probably be very careful of like, I'm going to put everything exactly mm-hmm. back and I'm going to take a picture before I touch anything and then make sure it matches before I leave kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, is spooky because it's it's a weird thing to if it wasn't true they gave me this when i got out of the hospital it would be a weird immediate um go to you know like if he was lying or something i would just be like oh sorry um my mistake you know and like run off or something but she said he seemed super confused so uh either he Really hadn't been there before, but he had been told, like, this is, go there, get on your feet for a couple days or something. That's, I I haven't fully fleshed it out, but that's, like, what my working theory is. My whole thing was, I think it was his apartment, he was in a coma or in some sort of hospital situation, and that... When he left, if he had just had a key in his belongings, I don't think they're going to be like, well, your apartment wasn't there anymore. Sorry. You know, it's just like, here's all your shit. Bye. And then you're like, well, the only thing I have is this key with this address. So I might as well go to it. Wouldn't you knock on the door first? Uh, well, he's being in a coma for eight years. You don't. Maybe you don't know how long you were out for. Uh, then the doctors haven't done their job. If you wake up from a coma, first of all, and they just send you by yourself, I would yeah, hope bye. your family members would would accompany you or something, or that someone would have. Maybe he didn't some have sort any, of but... like some some person to help you as you leave. Yeah, I, uh, I. If I had just woken up from a coma eight years later, I personally would not show up at a home and just try to walk right in. I think I'd knock first because I'd probably assume. That uh, I didn't live there anymore. They moved on. They moved on while Especially you were Especially an apartment. Like while you were sleeping. Classic film. I know I've seen... Sandra Bullock? Bill Pullman. I've seen, seen part Bill of it. Pullman. I don't think I've... Did somebody get into a coma? They fell into in front of a train or something? In the subway, yeah. Yeah. His head. It was Peter Gallagher yes. with those eyebrows. Eyebrows. Good Lord. I don't know why she thought Peter Gallagher was so hot when Bill Pullman was clearly way hotter. And she was... Engaged to him, but he she goes was into a, token a coma. Taker. She was a token taker, and she just had a crush on Peter Gallagher because she thought he was hot. Oh. And she jokingly would be like, "That's my husband. That's my husband." Or we're gonna get married someday. And she says that she she helps him go to the hospital, and then as they're taking him away, she's like, "Oh, we were gonna get married," which was just her like she would joke with her best friend yeah. at work that that was like her future husband. And the nurses were like, "That's his fiance." Oh. And then the family meets her, and it's a wacky case of mistaken identity. Who Who's Bill Pullman? The coma guy's brother. Uh-oh. And there, sparks fly while mm-hmm. coma guy's out, and then he wakes up and turns out he's kind of an ass. <laughs> so I'm going to assume she gets with Bill Pullman. Oh, does she? <laughs> <laughs> well, good for her. Well, these were all very interesting. Um, if you've got theories... Comment on uh, Instagram or or uh, send an email or something, and we'll do an update on our next one with everybody's <laughs> most. Um, and maybe there's a bunch of theory. Like if everybody's like, no, it has to be this, and we'll talk about it. We'll talk everybody bet, about everybody's theories. We got sleuths. We got sleuths on the case. Yeah, somebody. Yeah, honestly, with more information, probably somebody could get to the bottom of this. But Certainly. that's up to. Uh, Sammy, if she wants to reveal more information, so we can we can we'll solve this mystery. We'll solve with it. your help and our cool trench coats. Yes, and our trench coats. <laughs> well, thank you again to everybody that sent in a Freaky Friday story. If you have an odd but true story, maybe you've encountered Bigfoot, you've seen a UFO, you had a brush with true crime, or you felt the presence of an otherworldly being, send them in at sinisterhood.com slash Freaky Friday. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost, so if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, and recording and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves and Getting Into It tier, a special shout-out on the show, 
a monthly bonus mini-sode. This month, it's a Murdoch update and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and a new segment coming soon, which is Off My Chest, True Confessions from Oof. Reddit. We did one earlier. Some interesting, funny, and heavy stuff kind of all over the place. Run the gamut. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. The next one is the 22nd, 8 p.m. Central Time. And then our stream, our live stream is the following night, the 23rd, same time. Same bat channel. For our patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available, and those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. What else can they do by going to Sinisterhood.com, Heather? You can get tickets to our live Mm -hmm. shows, including our live show tonight in Philadelphia, June 17th. You're going to love the topic. It's a Chestnut Hill favorite, and it's not the Schmitter sandwich, but it's just as delicious. (laughs) And if you miss this, if you're listening to this on June 18th, 19th, on and on, doesn't matter. You can still see us in Chicago, Milwaukee, Tampa, Orlando. We're coming to you. Mm -hmm. We'll find you. You'll find us. All these topics are kick-ass. We've all picked them, and they're very fun and cool. So go to SinisterHood.com slash live shows, or you just go to SinisterHood.com and mash live shows on the top banner. If you're on mobile, there's a little hamburger menu in the top right corner. It's little two little lines. Looks like a little hamburger. Click that. Go to the hamburger, always. (laughs) So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet SinisterHood merch. Keep those pictures coming. If you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on shop in the top banner or inside the hamburger. (laughs) The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. You can also share any of our episodes with them by clicking the three little dots up in the right-hand corner. If two lines is a hamburger, three dots is a french fry. Tater tots. Tater tots. <laughs> that's what they are. Or Click those tater down tots and share. Looking down into the french fry mm-hmm, bucket. Mm-hmm. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can also go to Sinistera.com slash playlist and you'll find playlists of all of our episodes, including Freaky Friday. If you're like, you got to check out all these Freaky Friday episodes to your friend and they're like, I'm not trying to scroll through a whole feed. You're like, I got you, boo. Bam. You got a playlist and you can share it. Right from the website. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. We also have TikTok and YouTube. Christy, where are you at on the computer? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and I am on TikTok and Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I'm on the Twitter at MCK versus the world and I'm on TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Sinner.